Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're cousins and we're going to be doing special music together today. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for everyone that's here today. I pray that you would give them the message that they need today. Let them take out of this what they need. Please speak through me, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So imagine that you're looking at the world and you see an arm coming down out of heaven. And this arm is holding a scepter, you know, like what kings have that shows their authority, a uh, golden scepter. And on the end of this scepter, there is a crown. It's this beautiful crown, and it's covered with diamonds. And the diamonds are bright with light, and they're reflecting and throwing off this light. And as you look at it from different angles, it's glinting and flashing with light. It's a beautiful crown. And uh, on the crown is an inscription that says, All who win me have happiness, 
and shall have everlasting life. Now, uh, below this crown and scepter, there's another scepter, and there's another crown. And this other crown is also a beautiful crown. Uh, it has jewels on it. And there's, uh, it's an a, a enclosed crown that can hold things. You've seen crowns with, with that are not just, you know, circlets, but they're enclosed. And it uh, is full of gold and silver. And this crown is also somewhat light, but it's not as bright as the other crown. This crown has an inscription that says, Earthly treasure, riches is power. All who win me have honor and fame. So, um, as you're looking, you see that there is a vast crowd in front of these two crowns. And uh, a large part of the crowd is rushing toward the crown that says earthly treasure. Um, if you've seen like crowds on Black Friday, you know how they push and shove and they're really rough. And this is what this crowd is doing. They're so rough that people will fall down and the crowd will just mow over them, trying to get this earthly treasure crown. And there's all kinds of people in the crowd. Uh, some people are old and they have white hair and there are lines on their faces of, of anxiety and worry from uh, uh, their long lives. And uh, then they get to the, some reach the crown, they get to the crown and they're taking hold of the gold and silver. Even though they're old, they're grasping at it like they have to have it. And they have, uh, you know, relatives in the crowd who are looking at them with pleading looks on their faces like, please, we need your help. But they won't give them help. They're holding as tight as they can to whatever they've been able to get. As people rush forward to this crown, they see what's in it, and they count and recount all of the coins and things that they see in it, all the treasure. And they're thinking about how much they could have and what they could do with it. Also in the crowd, there are people who are uh, weak, sickly. Um, some of them are deformed and... Uh, they are overpowered by the stronger people in the crowd. And some of them are pushed down and uh, trampled. Um, and, and in fact, it's so violent that uh, ma many people are dying. So some people, when they're just about to reach the crown, they die, either it's the end of their life or they're trampled. Some people have just gotten a hold of it and then they die. But some people do manage to reach it, and they get a hold of it. And uh, when they reach it, there's a crowd of people around the crown that uh, applaud them. Well done, you know, welcome to the inner circle. And they're very pleased with them. And there's another group that's very pleased with them. And it's a group of evil angels. Satan is there with his evil angels, and he's watching and he's very pleased to see all these people rushing toward this crown. Well, uh, also in the crowd are people who claim to be followers of Jesus. And uh, some of these people see the crown of life, the crown that's covered with diamonds as well, and they look at it, but then they look back at the other crown. And some of them are are kind of reaching for the crown of life, but kind of lazily, not, without m not with much effort. And mainly their main effort and focus is going to pushing through the crowd to get closer to the crown of earthly treasure. Now there are some others in this crowd that eventually get disgusted with how the crowd is behaving. You know, they see how everybody's pushing and shoving and being violent and selfish, and they look at the other crown and they start to think that would be better for them. So they break away and they start going after um, the crown of life. So in the amidst this vast crowd, th this is now the, the counter current within the crowd. People who are not going after the earthly treasure crown, but who are going after this other crown. Their eyes are, are fixed on this other crown. They're looking at it steadfastly. And as they go through the crowd, this small current against the massive current of the crowd that's going the other way, angels are there helping them. 
and the angels will help part the crowd so that they can go through. As they get closer uh, to the crown of life, the light coming from those diamonds on the crown starts to light up the way around them so they can see uh, more clearly where they are and where they're going. And the light also starts to reflect off of them. And as they get closer and closer, they start becoming brighter and brighter and looking more like the angels that are leading them. Well, the other crowd sees them and thinks that they're foolish for going against the current. And the other crowd starts to throw something at them. You can imagine somebody throwing rocks or uh, snowballs or something, but these are uh, projectiles that uh, are dark like ink. And as long as the people going after the crown of life keep looking at it and focusing on it, they're not hurt by whatever gets thrown at them. But as soon as they start focusing on what gets thrown at them, they get stained at it, almost like they've been hit with a blob of ink. Now, as you're looking at this scene, um, at this point, you see uh, a scripture. And the scripture is, uh, you can, if you'd like, open your Bibles and, and read it along. It's Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either they will hate the one and love the other, or else they will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, so what does this scene mean? Well, the first crowd, the big crowd chasing the lower crown, that is those who love the attractions of the world, the treasures of the world. So uh, we saw many types of people in this crowd. You know, they're the professed Christians. They're part of the crowd. They say that they are uh, looking for God, but really their main aim in life is to get earthly treasure of whatever kind they're interested in. And as long as that's where their eyes are fixed, they can't love Jesus. They love what they're focused on. And as they uh, move closer and closer to it, the light that they have becomes darkness until eventually it goes out and they're left stumbling and fumbling in the dark. This is what happened to, um, as we call him, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He said, I've kept the commandments. And uh, Jesus got to the heart of it that what he loved and what he focused on most was his possessions. And so he went away sorrowful. The light that Jesus had given him, he allowed to go out and become darkness. So also in this crowd is the old, the elderly, people who are coming toward the end of their life. And um, as we were seeing it, you know, at this time when they might be thinking more of God and heavenly things, instead they're thinking more about what they've trained themselves to care about all through their lives. And so these people uh, come to the end of their life, but they're even more trying to grasp their idol than ever before. And they may have uh, family members who need their help, but they're not willing to sacrifice um, for, these, for these people. And then we also have the, the sickly in the crowd. And these, these are people who um, may not be in good health. Um, they may not have a good, good mental powers. 
and they, they don't have what the earth would call success, but they also are not seeking God, and so they fail to have earthly success because of um, where they are, where they've, they've come from, and the struggles that they have, and they also fail to have the world to come, which is a, a tragedy. Now, uh, we also saw that there are those who actually reach their goal, and these are the people who reach what they were trying to get, whatever their earthly treasure is, and they're celebrated, and they have influence in the world. Um, and Satan is also happy at this because he knows that as long as this is their ultimate aim, he has control over them, and he's able to use them in the world. And um, finally, we have the people who become disgusted of this uh, ridiculous rat race where they see and they understand the end of it and they don't like the behavior of the crowd. And so they turn and they start focusing on the crown of life instead. And that brings us to the other crowd that's going toward the crown of life. This, th these are um, God's faithful people. And they come from all walks of life. There can be Christians there, uh, there can be Muslims there, there could be atheists there. They are people who, regardless of where they came from, how they were brought up, what they understand in their inmost souls, they're true, they're honest, they're looking for the truth. And so they are God's faithful people. And God is, is leading them. And whether they, you know, whatever understanding they come to within their lives, they're, they're being led. And uh, even if Heaven is the first time that they hear the name Jesus or they see the nail marks in Jesus' hands and feet. Now these people, angels, are leading. Angels are making the way th for them through the, the spiritual uh, difficulties that they encounter. And whoever they are, you know, whether they're Christian uh, outwardly or not, the world will be at enmity with them because they're going against the worldly system. Um, th this is where the projectiles that people are throwing at them come in, right? These represent the lies that the world will tell about these people. Well, you're only doing this because you're a contrarian. You're only doing this because you want to feel better about yourself and, and try to make me look bad. You're doing this because, you know, you're holier than thou. But as long as they don't focus on that, as long as they keep their eyes focused on the crown of life, they're perfectly okay. It's only when they look and they focus on that negativity that they're able to be hurt by that negativity. And as they go and get closer, they look more and more like the angels that are leading them and more and more like Christ. So this was, this, was, uh, this um, sort of parable is could leave you with the impression that um, I'm saying you have to be unsuccessful to be holy. You have to be, do you have to be poor to be holy? Do you have to give up what the earth considers treasure to be holy? So first of all, um, yeah, the short answer is, n is no. You don't have to be poor to be holy. Some, some people believe this. You know, some groups take vows of poverty because they think that that is necessary. Um, but if you look in the Bible, you don't have to look very far to see that God's followers are not always necessarily impoverished. If you look only at, at the book of Genesis, you'll see Abraham who faithfully followed God. Uh, God made him very wealthy and respected. But um, also, it's, it, you know, it's not just about uh, wealth or money. Because earthly treasure uh, can be other things, too. It can be, you know, fitness. It can be uh, romance. It can be anything that's temporary that people uh, put as their ultimate goal in life that they get fixated on. And again, if you look in the Bible, um, those things that I just mentioned are not, uh, not things that God's followers cannot have because they're bad in themselves. No. Uh, if you look at, e you know, even at Genesis again, Joseph was a good-looking man, you know. He uh, was successful uh, outwardly. So 
if that's the case, you know, why, it, it, why, is, why is the parable about turning away from earthly treasure? You know, what's wrong with seeking it? Um, well, it, it's about, I would say, well, let me, let me put it this way. So imagine that there's a uh, very successful man who's out uh, strolling along in the park, and he meets a woman in the park, and he's very wealthy, but she's not. But they don't know that about each other. They just get to talking. And they find out that they have a lot in common. And um, they start to see each other more regularly. Eventually, they fall in love. Eventually, they decide to get married. Imagine that, uh, you know, this man has many houses, uh, a penthouse and, and so on, but it comes out that this woman is homeless, and she doesn't even have a place to live at all. So now they get married. They have a wonderful, beautiful wedding ceremony. And at the end of the ceremony, she says, wow, that was so nice. Well, see ya. And he says, see ya, what do you mean? Uh, we're going together, right? She says, no, actually, I'm going back to the overpass where I live. She says, no, you can come with me. You know, we can go to my penthouse. We'll go to the villa that I have in the south of France, you know, wherever you want to go. And she says, no, because, you know, I can't leave my highway overpass. Sounds ridiculous, but that's how, that's how we are with God sometimes. When Jesus asked the, as we call him, rich young ruler, to sell all that he had, he was asking him to put God first in his life. And God wants that type of relationship with us like a husband and wife have. If you, if you look in Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, um, God says, it will be in that day you will call me husband and not master. And in a, a, in a marital relationship, you share everything with each other. Uh, Steps to Christ says, what do we give up when we give all? A sin-polluted heart for Jesus to purify, to cleanse by his own blood, and to save by his matchless love. And yet people think it hard to give up all. I'm ashamed to hear it spoken of, ashamed to write it. God does not require us to give up anything that it is for our best interest to retain. So when, when this rich young ruler was being asked to give up all, and when we were asked to give up all, God is going to give us everything in replacement. It says in Luke chapter 18, Most certainly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for God's kingdom's sake, who will not receive many more times in this time and in the world to come eternal life. So God is the owner of everything. As it, as it says in Psalms, the world is mine, God says, everything that's in it. So the question, the question isn't, you know, if I give up all, how much is God going to give me in return? Because he's going to give you everything in return. The question um, you maybe should ask instead is, how much should I have here and now? How much can I handle here and now? And uh, only God knows the answer to that. You don't know, the, I don't know the answer to that. You don't know the answer to that. Um, God alone knows how much you can handle that you would be able to uh, not be corrupted by, but still be able to um, inherit the eternal kingdom that's coming. And, uh, you know, if you think about it in, in terms of wealth, you think about all the, all the wealthy people who are, who are corrupt, and, uh, and it gives them a, a way to live out that corruption and instead of to change. Um, you know, if, you, if God gave you the uh, immense wealth, you could be the next uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Um, you don't know, we don't know. You know, somebody who uses that to do evil. And God knows, and he's able, if you put your trust in God, he's able to give you um, the right amount that's good for you. Uh, it says in um, Proverbs chapter 30, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. And God 
while he gives you everything, he alone is the one who knows what food is needful for you. So the, the, uh, the earthly crown, you know, it's, it's still attractive to us, whether it's, it's money or the other things that we've mentioned, uh, the fame and the honor. And, and it's attractive because, you know, again, in, in themselves, these things are not bad things, but they're bad things by themselves, as ends in themselves. Uh, because they don't require love. Uh, they're, like, they're like pieces of who God is. Uh, fame, is, you know, is a piece, but it's not the entire circle or the entire picture. And if you pursue one of them by itself, uh, it's unhealthy. You know, if you think about fame, if fame is where your eyes are fixed, you don't have to be loving uh, to be famous. You know, Adolf Hitler is famous. It's a famous name, but he was a terrible person. And um, if we seek these things that are parts of who God is, it, ca- it leads to, to spiritual deformity. Um, another reason we can get fixated on this earthly crown is maybe we're people pleasers. Uh, you know, again, this is something that's not unhealthy in itself. We should want to live peaceably, as peaceably as we can with all people. We shouldn't want to make uh, people unhappy. But when we make that the end and the goal, uh, it's a problem because we have sinful natures and people can be made happy by things that are not necessarily good for them or good for you temporarily. And so uh, uh, we have to think, we have to keep it in perspective. Um, I like what uh, Marcus Aurelius wrote. He was a a Roman emperor who was considered one of the good emperors of Rome. Uh, He was a a philosopher and and he was a... um, peaceful ruler, he, he wrote, uh, to, you know, to remind himself, ponder the fickleness of those who are applauding you. And it's the idea that uh, you shouldn't care that much whether you're getting praised or scorned because people are fickle, and today they may be uh, cheering you on, and then tomorrow they may be trying to get you fired from your job. Uh, we see this r- right today with the cancel culture that very suddenly and very swiftly people can turn on you and uh, now you don't have a place to work anymore and you're cut off. And that's today. And we believe that uh, someday, as it says in the book of Revelation, we'll see cancel culture in its final form. People will be uh, prevented from buying and selling if they don't go along with the mainstream culture. So, th- you know, keep it in perspective. Yes, we want to make people happy and not sad, but we also can't make that what we're fixated on because people are are fickle and um, they can turn on a dime. Psalm 37 says, uh, evildoers will soon be cut down like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When you delight yourself in him, your desire will be for him to give you what's, uh, what's needful for you. So uh, if you turn back to the, the other crown, the inscription, all who win me are happy, this we need to focus on. And this is, I, I like that the word happy is there because I think... Uh, Too often Christians will spiritualize away joy into something theoretical. And uh, joy as a principle, I don't really understand when when people say it's just a a principle or it's just an abstract concept. But happiness I can understand because I felt happy and I felt sad. And uh, when this crown says, all who win me are happy, it's really talking about in this world, you can be happy if you follow God. It's actual happiness. And I think uh, we don't always uh, teach it because we don't always uh, experience it. And we don't always experience it because we're part of that crowd who's looking at the earthly crown and then looking back at the heavenly crown and then back at the earthly crown because our eye is not single. If our eye is single, 
we can experience that happiness that's promised to us. Uh, Review and Herald's uh, 1884, let us never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is a wellspring of joy. He does not delight in the misery of human beings, but loves to see them happy. And uh, I like that it says never lose sight of that fact, because I think that's something we do need to keep reminding ourselves all the time, that Jesus loves to see us happy, uh, literally, uh, in a normal sense, happy. So in, in conclusion, um, I just want to remind you this week, whatever you do as you're going about work and you know, if you, as you have free time, just think about that picture of the two crowns and think about where you are looking. You know, are you looking at the lower crown? Are you looking at the higher crown? Where is your focus in what you're doing? And um, I would encourage you to keep your eyes fixed on the crown of life because that's how you can experience the happiness that God wants you to experience and how you can have everlasting life in the world that's to come. Again, I'll close with uh, Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart.